I forgot to look up the Taylor Swift lyric to make this joke. Fuck. Hey, book besties. My name is Angie. This is my channel. Maybe I'll read today where we talk about books that I may or may not have read. And this time I finally admit I may have, definitely have, cut my bangs too short. I realized how uneven they were and then as I was trying to make them more and more even-ish, I got this far and I was like, I need to stop. So this is the vibe that we have going on for this vlog and for like the next month and a half. We're not just here to cry about my hair, we're adults and we're here to read. This is another one of those read a couple of books from an author and then I tell you how I feel about them. The first one we did was Riley Sager and I'll put that up in the but today we're gonna be reading a whole bunch of Sylvia Moreno Garcia. I have read two of their books in the past. I read The God of Jade and Shadow and I didn't really enjoy it. And then I read Mexican Gothic and I enjoyed that one more, but then upon reflection, it still didn't really live up to the hype for me. So we're just trying again. And one of the reasons why we're trying again is because I don't remember who and I'm so sorry, but someone on Instagram suggested that I, I try again for this vlog series. And her book, Silver Nitrate, recently came out. And this book's premise really intrigued me. It is about Montserrat and she loves movies. So the same as these. And she gets involved with this like mystery of like, a haunted lost film question mark so i guess we're doing the tv on our so this is book one we're also going to be giving the daughter of dr moreau a chance this is arguably the one that i'm like least interested in but it matches really well with my outfit today one is a retelling of the island of dr moreau and i have no idea what that is so that's great. And then we have these two books, which I think are like her like backlist, backlist books. We have Certain Dark Things, which is about vampires. Sexy vampires. I actually don't know if they're sexy, but if they're vampires, they're automatically sexy. So that's that. And then there's this one, Untamed Shore. I've actually never heard of this one before. I've heard of all of these other ones. This one is, it seems to be like the sleeper agent of her backlist. And I picked it up because I really like the cover. I like the shark. It follows this woman and she spends her days watching dead sharks piled beside the seashore and then she gets involved with a bunch of American tourists and then shit happens because shit always happens when you get involved with a bunch of American tourists. So that's the TBR, that's what we're doing this vlog and it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm putting all of my past feelings about Sylvia Moreno Garcia's books and my reading experiences to the side and I'm excited to give, give her another shot. I think it's gonna be really great. I think we're gonna start with either Silver Nitrate or Untamed Shore, because those are the ones that I'm the most intrigued by. Hey, book babies. I started Untamed Shore. I am halfway through chapter eight. We're following Viri. She is a unofficial translator tour guide of like the beach town that she lives in. She's not really like other girls because she doesn't care about marriage or dating or boys and she just likes to read books, which I think if I remember correctly is a trend in a lot of her books. Just a lot of like not like other girl girls, but basically she gets assigned to translate and be the personal assistant of this American family who is staying for the summer. This family consists of Ambrose, who is a writer, his wife Daisy, who is a white woman, that's her job, <laughs> and her brother Gregory, who is also a white man, that is also his job. My second complaint about uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia's books is that she has a fascination with making the love interest a blonde white man. This happened in Mexican Gothic in a way that did not make sense to me, in a way that disturbed me by the end of the book because I was like, after all of that, you're still gonna stay around with this man and his family, hello? Even though I think the rest of his family dies, I actually don't remember, spoilers. And in this book, our protagonist becomes immediately intrigued by the sophistication and the whatever of this American man. He's like 10 years her senior and he's talking about like how he's gonna take her around the world and buy her nice things and blah 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 you know like all of the white american man promises that white american men make whenever they visit a foreign country and so she seems pretty enamored by this guy and i don't like it that's really all that's happened so far in the book i think in the summary it says that one of the americans die fingers crossed it's ambrose because he's really abusive and horrible 
or it's Gregory because I don't trust him. But I think it might be Daisy because she's kind of forgettable in her own way. And what's more dramatic than a white woman dying, you know? Eight chapters in, white man romance. Not surprised, but disappointed. <laughs> Hi, exactly two seconds later. Vidi and Gregory are having like a moment, right? Because the family might be going back to Mexico City and if they go back to Mexico City, they don't need her as a personal assistant anymore. And so they're having their little moment and he's like, I really don't want to go. I'm going to miss you so much. Um, you're the only girl for me, blah, blah, blah. And then he gives her his camera and he's like, I don't have a bouquet of flowers or a ring for you. This is all I got. Take it as a sign of my love. Blah. She accepts it and he just goes, so... Have you ever given anyone a blowjob? And she's just like, is that why you gave me this camera? Like, is this payment? What happened to the romanticism? So all this to say is, I hate it here. How you doing on this lovely day? It's actually not that lovely. It's supposed to start thunderstorming in like an hour and it's gonna keep thunderstorming for the next four days. Very sexy, very cool. I have an update for Untamed Shore. I don't have it in front of me. I actually don't know where I put it, but I did read up until chapter 12 last night. And before I go into what I think is gonna happen, let me tell you what has happened. We finally got our dead American. In the blurb, it promised us a dead American and we finally got it. Unfortunately, question mark, it's just Ambrose and I feel like his his death is the most insignificant because he was like barely mentioned in the first third of the book anyways. I was really hoping it was going to be Gregory because I dislike the man. Basically what happens is BD is hanging out in the guest room and she hears a kerfuffle. There's yelling, there's things being thrown, and then there's a loud thud. And she's like, that sounds serious. And she goes out to investigate and Ambrose is just lying dead at the bottom of a staircase. So they get like the local doctor and the local funeral guy and the local police to kind of like wrap this up. And when they ask what happens, Gregory steps in and he's like, oh, Ambrose was really drunk and he tripped and he fell down the stairs. This was all just a very awkward accident. Everyone kind of accepts that story. However, Ambrose has been sober for the past like six months-ish, I don't know. So after BD calls them out, they like quickly confess, yeah, that's not actually what happened. Daisy pushed him down the stairs after they were having a huge fight and BD feels kind of guilty for lying, but at the same time, she's like, these guys are my friends and I really care about them. They really understand me. Even though she's only known them for about a week. So she continues to lie and she feels a little bad about it. Which brings me to my next point. The vibes between Daisy and Gregory are really weird in my opinion. And I'm starting to suspect we have a Crimson Peak situation on our hands. For those who have not seen the movie Crimson Peak, spoilers ahead, but basically a Crimson Peak situation entails that a sibling duo goes around, targets rich individuals, seduces them, marries them, they move in with the family, they cut off their spouse from the rest of the world, kill them, and inherit all of the money. The added twist to the Crimson Peak situation is that the sibling duo is also in an incestuous relationship. So that's where I think we're heading with this story. And the reason I think that is because at a certain point, Gregory starts sharing little snippets of him and Daisy's life to Beatty, and and he mentions this one thing about how like a few months ago Daisy was pregnant and she lost the baby and how that changed the relationship between the trio completely and he says something along the lines of Daisy was really devastated but I never wanted kids and that's like a weird thing to say about your siblings pregnancy like who cares if you never wanted kids because that's not your kid you feel me? And they seem really hung up on the fact that like Daisy is actually not part of the will so they're not getting the money that they wanted, which kind of throws a wrench in their whole Crimson Peak plan. So they're either actually siblings in an incestuous relationship or because all blonde people look vaguely similar, no offense to blondes, they pretend that they are siblings but are actually two individuals who are secretly dating. So that, those are my theories. The plan for today was to hopefully read a ton because like it's gonna be rainy and whatever, but I actually just got assigned a whole bunch of stuff at work. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. I'm also hopefully going to the library. I have to pick up these beautiful ones by Silvia Moreno Garcia. I don't know why I decided to like be an overachiever with this vlog because we're already reading four of her books, but I decided to add another one. Freaking cares, this is gonna come out in November anyways, probably.
when they got you working at your job, were you signed up to work for money in exchange for time that you spend working at your job work? Can we just talk about how euphoric it feels to be right about something? Luckily, I get to feel that feeling often because I'm always right about things. Because I was right about Untamed Shore, we got a Crimson Peak situation on our hands. Reluctant, boop, 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 boop. I got up to chapter 18, I was listening to the audiobook, and it has been revealed that Gregory and Daisy are in fact in a romantic relationship. Luckily, they're not actually siblings. Again, my other hypothesis that they were just two white people and BD just assumed that they were related <laughs> was correct. And she is so real for that. Other developments, Ambrose's nephew showed up and he is investigating the death of his uncle because he thinks that some foul play was involved. This is a major plot line, but I have no skin in the game, so I don't necessarily care. <laughs> the only thing I don't like about this guy is that he's clearly like the good American choice for BD. As she's helping this guy, you know, he understands her movie references and he's smart and intellectual and articulate. So I feel like the book is going to end with her being clearly disgusted with Gregory and all of his shenanigans, but ultimately falling for a white American anyways. So we are still a touch unimpressed and disappointed. <laughs> Happy Monday, besties. I feel like exactly how I look. I didn't do anything sexy or cool over the weekend because I think there's like a hurricane coming up the coast and so the weather has been pretty blah. I also told myself I was going to go for a walk this morning to, you know, reset my week, get into it. Yeah, but it's still pretty gray out and I think it's supposed to start raining in like an hour so I use that as an excuse to not do anything. So we're doing just fantastic. <laughs> I finished Untamed Shore. I didn't love it, but it also wasn't bad. It was interesting and intriguing and in a lot of ways it was also kind of predictable in the way that like thrillers as a genre can be pretty predictable. I won't give away all the details in the ending, but just know that I was partially right about the whole American white man thing. It's not necessarily ending in like a romance, but she does still end up with a white American. To sum it all up, not enough sharks in this book and two too many blonde white men. Three and a half stars. So, so after that, I actually took a little break from Silvia Moreno Garcia because that's one of the lessons I learned with the Riley Sager vlog. If you read one author back to back, it sucks. And so I actually started a book about snails. I kind of used it as a buffer this weekend. And then Sunday morning, I started Certain Dark Things. Initially, I did not like this. And I think it's just because it was a lot of info dumping all at once. And it was a lot of characters being introduced every other chapter. And I'm not super opposed to a multi-point of view book, but I do find it a touch jarring to have to switch point of views every chapter. I'm finally getting a feel for one character and then the chapter ends and then it's just like a new guy and it's just like, whoa, who are you and what are you doing in my house? But 11 chapters in and I think I'm enjoying this book a little bit more. So we're following a whole cast of characters, like I said. The first is Domingo, who is probably my favorite of the entire cast of characters. He is a 17 year old garbage collecting street kid and he is fascinated by vampires. Like he's super into the whole like comic book movie lore. In the reality of this world, vampires actually exist. So when he meets an actual vampire, he's not necessarily like scared. Like he's a little intimidated. He's a little unsure of the situation he found himself in, but at the same time, he's super stoked. And the vampire that he meets is another one of our main protagonists named Atul. And there's a whole lore of like the different species of the vampires, which I think is actually really cool. But she's like Aztec, ish vampire and they can only drink the blood of young people so when she meets domingo she's like hey do you want to make some quick cash and he's like yeah sure i don't do any weird sex stuff but you're kind of hot and i'm down to clown that's like paraphrased but that's essentially what he says but i think domingo is such a treat i think he's so funny and atul she's just like a vampire i don't know i don't really know a lot about her just as of yet i know that her family and she's looking for somebody and that somebody is going to help her 
her with something. She's kind of mysterious in that way, so we don't have a lot of information about her. So those are like the two main guys, right? Atul and Domingo, they're great. Then we have a whole other cast of characters and they're all kind of like opposing forces. I feel like I need to bring in like a Pepe Silvia board to explain everything. But next we have Rodrigo, who is a servant for another family of vampires. And him and this junior vampire named Nicolas are on the hunt for Atul. She did something to their family and so they need to find her to get revenge. And then we just got introduced to a character named Anna, who is a cop. But she's not just a cop, she's a good cop. She wants to do things by the rules. So she gets introduced because Nicolas killed a young woman at a club and just left her body out there. And so now Anna is like, there's vampires in Mexico City and I'm going to hunt them down. So she's kind of like the vampire hunter of this whole jam. Out of all of the Silvia Moreno Garcia books that I've read, I think I'm enjoying this one the most. I just think that the world building is way more interesting. It takes place in like a modern day Mexico City, but it vampires and like sci-fi shit exists and I think it's so neat that there's like so much vampire lore like there's different like species and they all interact with each other in a different way and they all have their own histories and whatever and I just really like Domingo I think he's so funny I've already had canoned Domingo as the guy who plays Luffy in the live action one piece I feel like he has the same kind of energy I feel like we've been introduced to all of the main characters and so I think think things are gonna start picking up now. What's up gamers? I made a lot of progress on certain dark things. I'm on chapter 26. So I'm about two thirds of the way through. But without like boring you with all the details, the best way to sum up the last 150 pages is that the cat and mouse game is cat and mousing, babe. The police is going after the vampire Nick. The vampire Nick is going after Atul. Atul is still looking for the person that she's looking for. It's just a layer of chases and shenanigans. What I can tell you now is that the chapter that I just left off on, Atul and Domingo were like captured by Nick's gang. And so now they're trying to like break out and escape and fight him off. And so there's like a shootout happening and like vampire fights and whatever. And you're probably thinking, wow, that sounds really intense and high stakes. How did you stop in the middle of a chapter? If I'm being honest, I fell asleep. I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll probably say it for the rest of my life, but I do think that Silvia Moreno Garcia is so much better suited for like screenplay writing than like novel writing. In a lot of ways, this book feels super cinematic, which is great as a reader that makes you super entertained. But in other ways, while I'm reading, it also kind of feels like, oh, this is exactly where the commercial break is going. You know what I mean? And this hasn't happened often in this book. I think it happened more often in uh, The Gods of Jade and Shadow. But for just an example, literally the last chapter I read it ended with Nick the vampire saying hey he told her how have you been a long time no see you cock sucking whore <laughs> very not polite but then the next chapter literally repeats the line where he says hey how you been long time no see you cock sucking whore this feels like kind of like silly to have this like repetitive dialogue like from one page to another I understand it's a shift in point of view but it just kind of makes it feel a little clunky and it literally feels like when a movie is like edited to be aired on TV and and so like it goes to a commercial break and then when the commercial break is over it starts off from the last like two seconds of the the prior scene but aside from that like minor blip i'm really loving this book i'm hoping to finish it today I finished Certain Dark Things a few days ago and I really enjoyed it. I ended up giving it four stars because I really like the world building and like the exploration of like different vampire species that all like correlate with a certain culture's like vampire lore. I thought that was super neat. In the back of the book, the author also includes like a glossary of sorts explaining like each vampire like origin story and I thought that was super neat. Did I read all of it? No. I appreciated that it was there. I appreciated that it was not my biggest complaint is Sylvia Moreno Garcia's compulsion to include a romance in every book that she writes. Domingo and Ato end up being in a vampire human romantic relationship. And I know I joked in the beginning of this vlog, like, am DTF with any sexy vampire. And I still stand by that statement. I just like, I felt with the plot and the pacing of this book, the romance just felt so unnecessary. Along with the unnecessary romantic relationship between Domingo and Atul, their age gap also concerns me. He's 17, she's 23. It just gave me the ick. You spent half of the book talking about how he's too young. Um, Did he age five years in the course 
of 100 pages. No. And that's that she visually looks 23. She's actually older because hello vampire. And so I started The Daughter of Dr. Moreau and immediately I don't think I like it. And so I don't know if I'm going to continue it. I am only 16 pages in and apparently The Daughter of Dr. Moreau, this girly here, she's 14 years old and in typical Sylvia Moreno Garcia fashion they just introduced this white European man who's in his early 20s and he is visiting the island because he's gonna be like the new mayor of this island facility kind of thing and my concern is that this 14 year old is going to be romantically involved with that white European man. I just don't know if I'm in a place to go through that again, especially because she's a minor. That makes me deeply uncomfortable. Obviously, I'll have to continue reading to find out like where this goes, but I think I'm going to take a pause on this and I think we're gonna start The Beautiful Ones today. And I think this one follows a girl with telekinesis and that's all that I know. Hey, do I look as tired as I feel? Probably. But trust me, I am even more tireder. It's been two or three days since my last update. And the reason I haven't done an update in two to three days isn't because I haven't been reading. I actually have a good chunky update for you. But it's because I have been having the worst sleep of my life this week. I've been like waking up consistently at like three or four in the morning. So here I am. And now I'm ready to do an update. Well, mentally, I'm ready to do an update. Physically, I don't even know where I am anymore. But we've read a decent amount of The Beautiful Ones. I got up to chapter 18. I've been switching from the physical and audiobook as per usual. We're technically following Antonina and she has telekinetic powers. She meets this guy. He also has telekinetic powers and she's like immediately intrigued and enamored by him and he seems to feel the same way. However, and this is barely a spoiler because it's in the blurb and it's like revealed like two chapters in, he is pursuing Antonina with like an ulterior motive. He's actually trying to get close to her cousin Valerie. And the reason he's trying to do that is because Hector and Valerie had like a first love romance kind of situation when they were younger and she married someone else. And so he's like, okay, well, if I can't be with you, I'm at least going to be close to you and I'm going to seduce your younger cousin because she seems to be into me. I've only seen this movie once and I don't actually remember a lot about it but the way that the story is kind of playing out kind of reminds me of Atonement in the way that the movie opens up with Saoirse Ronan and so you think it's about her but the main characters are these lost loves Kira Knightley and James McAvoy and that's kind of how I feel about this book like I'm so sorry to Antonina. Antonina kind of feels like every other character that I read by this author and so I just kind of don't care for her. So sorry that she's being tricked. It's just like whatever, you know? But the, the characters that I'm mostly invested in are Hector and Valerie who in some readers' perspectives may be considered like the villains of the story. But I just find their relationship so much more compelling and especially like the first like 15 chapters where Valerie has been kind of forced to sit and watch her first love seduce this annoying little girl and she's been kind of reflecting on her own choices and her own life and it's revealed that the reason that she married her husband is that the family was losing money and she needed to do something to provide a sense of security for her family. She didn't come from a lot but because she was so charming and beautiful she was able to win the favor of this really rich guy. I just I kind of feel for Valerie. She's kind of going through it. Hector I find compelling because of his relationship with Valerie but I don't really care for him as an individual but in the last chapter that I read Antonina and Valerie and their family were going to their summer house and Antonina invited Hector to join them and Valerie was really against it because she, although she can't really do anything about their courtship she wants as little to do with it as possible and the chapter ends with Valerie and Hector like sneaking off into the library to like finally have a confrontation about like how they ended things so many years ago and in a heated moment of passion and hate they start kissing and Antonina walks in on them and and that's literally how the chapter ends. So it's like very juicy, very drama. It was a really slow start from the beginning. I didn't really like it, but now that the drama is starting, I'm intrigued. I will say 
not a lot of telekinetic shit going on <laughs> that definitely feels like an afterthought and there's also like mention of like the beautiful ones as like a status in this society valerie speaks sometimes about being considered a beautiful one and how being a beautiful one has like certain privileges but again it kind of feels like an afterthought because i still don't totally understand what a beautiful one is and that's kind of buck wild because i'm 130 pages in and the title is literally called the beautiful ones i cannot tell you what the point of being a beautiful one is besides being beautiful obviously this one definitely the world building kind of sucks but the drama is there so i'm probably going to continue to listen to the audiobook because i just don't have the eyeballs and the, the mental capacity to like sit down and read today that's my update Hey boo besties! This is exactly the day after my last update and I don't know if you can tell but I am feeling so awake and so alive and so good about life again. In case anyone was wondering, I actually slept through the night last night for the first time in like a week and a half. I'm also extra awake because I actually had to do errands this morning. Did a super early morning target run because I have a work thing coming up and I needed shoes for it. I was originally planning on wearing my creepers i started to like overthink it and i was like is that too edgy goth punk rock cool for a work thing maybe and so then i went to target and i just got some like random basic strappy heels that can pair with literally anything and i also got some new sweatpants and they're really cute do you like them they're like this purpley checkered color and if you know anything about me you know that I love the freaking color purple. I'm literally becoming one of those like purple ladies. I'm feeling great. And I also have a huge book update for you. I read up to chapter 20, page 266 last night, all in one sitting. The second half of this book picks up dramatically in a literal and metaphorical sense. Where we left off, uh, Hector and Valerie were making out in the library and Antonina walked in on them. Summer vacation is promptly finished. Everyone goes their separate ways and in part two starts off a year after those events. So Antonina is more mature, more sure of herself. The same way that I'm a new man after sleeping one night, she's a new woman after being scorned and betrayed. So in book two, Antonina is finally like the main character. It makes sense why her name is the first one listed here. And things are going well for her. You know, she's like flirting with this guy they're going on dates things are seemingly going well whatever whatever right and then she crosses paths with Hector again and it kind of like opens up a door that she has been trying to ignore for the past year she's understandably hesitant about speaking to him and about forgiving him but they just continue to cross paths and they just seem drawn to each other for whatever reason Hector on the other hand after that whole drama at the summer house came to the realization that Miss Valerie is a bitch <laughs> He says in not so many words. He has been in love with Antonina this whole time. And I personally don't really buy that. It feels kind of disingenuous on his end. One of the reasons why Hector and Antonina's relationship doesn't feel like real to me is because the only thing that they really have in common is their telekinetic powers. That's great. But the way that that's formed a bond between them kind of makes it seem that like having telekinetic powers is something to be like outcasted for. And it's very hard to live with these powers and they live in a society that doesn't accept them however that's not shown in like the world building like Hector is a famous performer for his powers Antonina does not get like punished really for her powers at all like people seem to enjoy them the only one who doesn't really enjoy it is her like fiance because he thinks it's a little weird and then Valerie unfortunately became something of a side character in the second half of this book I think she's still the most compelling of the three we know that she had limited options and so I think it makes sense for her to be a little bitter about the fact that Antonina has all of these options and all of these privileges and doesn't necessarily have to like follow the rules of society and she can get away with it so yeah I don't know Valerie is still my girl but in the second half of the book she is trying to scheme Antonina into an arranged marriage because Valerie has a business deal with the groom and the deal is only gonna go forward if they get married and most importantly she doesn't want Antonina to like win Hector so yeah she's super toxic she views Hector as an object but I still like her so that's kind of where we're at Antonina's engagement to this guy has been officially announced and all that's left is Hector's grand expression of love to disrupt the wedding and win over Antonina I got like 50 pages left I fully expect to finish this by the end of the day I'm actually about to head out to a 
doctor's appointment and I'll probably listen to the audiobook on my way there. I don't know if I'm gonna have anything else to share because I'm so close to the end and these are all my thoughts, so. This is about a week and a half after my last update. After finishing The Beautiful Ones, I felt a little like burnt out. If burnt out is not the right word, the other word I can think of is bored. And I just like really didn't feel like picking up another Silvia Moreno Garcia book. And then yesterday I finally felt like, okay, let's get back into this. Final thoughts on The Beautiful Ones is that it was perfectly fine. If I ever had to pick a completely across the board three star book, The Beautiful Ones would be it. I think that's also why I kind of fell into a Sylvia slump. I don't think I like her historical historical work, but the ones that are set in like more recent history, I think are more fun and more compelling. Yesterday, I finally started Silver Nitrate, the girl who started this vlog, and I got really far. I got up to chapter 11, page 126, and I've really been loving it. It is just like a exactly everything that I'm interested in. So let's get into it. We follow these two characters. They are childhood friends. They are obsessed with movies. They are slightly codependent on each other. Montserrat is a sound editor and she's amazing at what she does. The only problem is that she is working in like a man's world. She is the only woman in her studio. They don't take her seriously. And because of that, she doesn't get as many projects as she would like. And she's also not the most like social person in the world. She's like very like blunt, abrasive, unlikable. Christian is a failing actor. He had one major breakout role in his early 20s, but his co-star and girlfriend at the time died in a car accident. Her family, they started a smear campaign against Tristian and so he's blamed for the car accident. And truly what I love about them is that they are, for lack of a better word, losers. I love reading about adult people who haven't really figured out like how to navigate life yet. There's something like endearing and comforting about a character like that in comparison to like a successful like CEO, which now that I'm saying out loud is probably why I don't like romance novels that much because I feel like the trope is always like they're already successful in every which way except for their romantic life and I think that's boring. I like to see a little struggle. I like to see a loser from time to time and Silver Nitrate is giving me my losers. But basically, despite being a failing actor, Christian wants to live in a luxury apartment. He wants to live that actor lifestyle that he lost so many years ago. And his neighbor in his new building is this other failed director. And so they connect. Montserrat is brought into like dinner parties and shit. They're talking about old Hollywood. And then this director drops this like little anecdote about like this missing movie of his. And he's like, yeah, we lost the funding. We lost the tapes. But on top of that, this movie was actually supposed to be a spell because the guy that I was working with was into some like weird occult shit and unfortunately because we never finished the movie the spell was never finished and because the spell was never finished everyone involved with that movie was cursed and we've had bad luck ever since and so he kind of like spins this tale of like well if we just happen to finish the last spell maybe our luck will turn around and if you help me maybe your luck will turn around too our two protagonists decide to indulge this old man like they don't believe in the magic but they're just like yeah sure if it'll give you closure like we'll help you finish this last bit of the movie and so they do just that and things are starting to look up Tristian gets the offer for a lead role in like a new drama and Montserrat's sister who has been diagnosed with cancer suddenly doesn't have cancer anymore and so they're like damn maybe there was something to it until Tristian sees his dead girlfriend in his apartment and they try to confront the old man and the old man is like, hey, anything can happen, magic baby. On top of the dead ghost girl, like the old man started receiving packages of like feathers and bones and whatever. And one of the packages gets delivered to Tristian instead and he accidentally opens it and he's like, yo, what the fuck is going on? Like, what did we get into? And the old man just 
just brushes it off and he's like oh yeah no that's just a protection spell like don't even freaking worry about it and they're like protection from what all we did was finish a movie for you like what why would we need protection he's like ah don't even think about it too much but i got it for myself just in case so that's my update i want to keep reading today but i'm actually really busy for the rest of the week tonight i'm going to the city for a work thing tomorrow i'm going to the city for another work thing thursday i have to go to <laughs> i have to go to the city again for another work thing i could theoretically read this on the train but I don't want to bring this giant book on the train. I want to bring a small bag. Who knows when I'll get to re read it again, but I desperately want to read it again. This has been it. It almost makes me sad to know that I have to read the Dr. Moreau book after this, but I'm gonna get the audiobook, so hopefully that'll be easier. But yeah, I'm really enjoying this one. have a couple of updates for you. First is I enjoyed my work thing. Thanks for asking. I thought it was really informative and interesting and cool. There was a like wine tasting networking part of it right at the end, but I actually left kind of early because I don't drink wine and I don't like to network. Something that I hope to get better eventually in the future one day. Second update is I didn't do a lot of reading over the course of the night. I was hoping to get a lot of reading done on like my commute to and from this work thing but I actually spent most of the train ride crocheting because my sister's birthday is coming up and it kind of sprung up on me and I had nothing planned but I remembered she likes plants and I remember that she doesn't have the best luck in keeping plants alive, so I decided to crochet her plant. Put a picture here if you're curious. It's cute. It's it's a tiny little, like, guy. As far as reading goes, I did read five chapters, so I'm on chapter 16 now. And I don't really remember what I said in my last update, and honestly, I don't think it was very coherent. And I think part of the reason it wasn't coherent is because I didn't fully understand the magic system that this man was was creating but basically in the same way that people in like the 1800s used mirrors to communicate with the dead the reason why mirrors were so effective as a magical tool is because of the silver coating and the audience between the individual and the spiritual world communicating with each other so his idea is that he makes a movie using silver nitrate film so the silver is like embedded in the film Film. He is communicating with a mass audience in the course of those 90 minutes or however long the movie is to conjure up as much energy as possible. So the original movie and the spell he was trying to make was a healing spell to like extend his life. The funding and everything was pulled just before he could complete the movie, thus complete the spell, and then he died shortly thereafter. Montserrat received the occultist's manifesto, and so she has been trying to decipher it, which is also why his magical system is making more sense, because we are following Montserrat as she is learning about it herself. And according to his magic system, certain individuals are are like predestined to have magical powers and it's all based in eugenics because he was a Nazi and so he believed that only white people would be able to have magical powers. We don't care for him but he's kind of pushing this plot forward. Our director was deemed Aryan enough to have the gift of clairvoyance and he basically calls Montserrat one night and he's like I'm gonna die at 2 30 and she doesn't believe him the following night she goes to his apartment and he's dead on the floor so he seems to have been actually psychic and the magic system seems to have some like foundation in reality or in truth or whatever so Montserrat is intrigued and now her plan is to speak to the other people involved in this movie to learn more and the reason I bring you here today is one because this is a vlog and so this is what we do and two because the more research Montserrat does the more she seems to buy into this and it kind of reminds me of this thing that I read and I don't know where I read it and I don't know if it's actually true but it was like something along the lines of like the people who are the most susceptible to cults are the people who are confident that they aren't so that concerns me because I feel like the more that she digs up the more she's gonna believe into in this shit and I don't really know how that leads to like the rest of the plot but it just generally concerns me because I like her another update is that I originally thought that the director was actually actually the occultist like using magic to appear to be like a, a friendly known face instead I think that they accidentally brought this guy back to life I have no proof 
I have no evidence. I have these ideas. I have no idea how it's gonna like unravel to an actual story. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. And I think that's kind of fun. Another final update is that I've decided we're not reading Dr. Moreau at all in this vlog. So sorry if you were looking forward to that, but the more that I think about picking up that book, the less I want to. And for that reason, our final book on this vlog is going to be Velvet is the Night, which is also set in the 70s and is like a noir missing persons mystery kind of deal, which I think is going to be really interesting and fun. <music> Hi! If you're seeing this clip, that means that I survived my work event gauntlet this week. I always complain about like the act of getting there and then I complain shortly thereafter because I like to complain. But if I'm being real, I had a good time. So because of that, I did not read anything in the last couple of days. But my boss was nice enough to give us the day off to kind of like recover from the festivities and it's raining all day so I really don't have any other option except to like sit my butt down and read and that's exactly what I've been doing. I don't know what chapter I'm on but I can tell you I'm 84% of the way through Silver Nitrate and things have been escalating but all you need to know is that they are working to reverse the spell. My fear about Montserrat is like coming to fruition unfortunately because while they're working to reverse the spell she's still doing her research and she'll say these little passing comments like oh well he didn't believe in this and this or we should do it this way because it's part of the book the point is to reverse the spell and the point is to not give this guy power and you're talking about him now with like a tone of admiration like you believe his shit and i think that's going to be like a big element in the last like 10 percent where like the spirit of this occultist is going to try and convince her to like actually bring him back or some shit like that i don't know been continuing to enjoy it the only thing i didn't enjoy is in the last couple of chapters there is like actual magic happening and we've been talking about magic of this whole vlog section so that might sound kind of dumb but like the entire time learning about this magic system they explained it as like a connection to the spiritual world like psychic abilities that's somewhat based in reality that i can like buy into it and i i've been enjoying that aspect a lot but there is this one part where like the cult lady like sent her culties out to fight them well, these cult members conjured up these attack dogs it was just like weird and i really Really didn't like it because like that power of like conjuring animals out of thin air that's fantasy and i wasn't expecting the book to take like a fantasy route luckily it only happened for one chapter and hopefully it won't happen again because i really didn't like that i would prefer it to just like stay in the realm of like spirituality and like shit like that instead of being like yeah you can conjure up animals out of thin air welcome back to the bed cam we finished silver nitrate i thought it was really good. If I had to rate it, I would give it four and a half stars. The reason why I'm taking out half a star is because they like brought back the fantastical magic system that I didn't like. I was really hoping that magic dogs were a fluke. They ended up coming back. And on top of that, uh, one of the characters had like electricity powers, like static shock levels of electricity control, which kind of felt really corny. And I was like, I thought this was like occult like seance spiritual shit like not the x-men but the rest of it i enjoyed a lot i really loved the main characters i mentioned it in a previous update but i love how much of a loser they both are and i love how they're losers together i also really liked how the power of friendship was a major theme throughout this book and that sounds really like cheesy and you know what maybe it is maybe the power of friendship is corny but also the power of friendship is beautiful and glorious actually went on a walk this morning for like the first time in a month and a half. So exciting to reunite with my turtles, except for the fact that I think it's too late in the year for the turtles to be out and about because I didn't see any. I guess I got to change my like hyperfixation to ducks, which is kind of unfortunate because I don't much care for birds. I have an update for you. We have started Velvet Was the Night. We are currently about 50% of the way through and I don't think I like it. In this book, we are again following two characters who will inevitably be in a romantic relationship together by the end of this book. These two characters consist of Maite and Elvis. Maite is a paralegal secretary kind of girl, and Maite is a self-described boring girl. Elvis is part of this gang 
who works alongside the police in the way that they are both used to silence protesters and activists. So two people from very different backgrounds. What brings them together is the disappearance of this girl named Leonora. And this girl is Maite's neighbor and has pictures that would incriminate Elvis and his gang. She goes missing, the pictures go missing, and both Maite and Elvis are like, we're gonna find this girl for their own reasons. And 50% of the way through and literally not much has happened. It has all just been like info dumpy, like background origin story stuff. Literally zero progress has been made about this missing girl. And for the blurb to like have a significant portion about this missing girl seems a little ridiculous to me. The blurb should have been like, hey, we follow Maite and Elvis. Maite is kind of a pathetic meow meow. Elvis is hung up on his cult girlfriend. And oh yeah, there's a missing girl. Which I think is an ongoing issue with Sylvia's writing style because like you can tell she does a lot of research. She does a lot of work in building these characters and making them fit in these settings in a way that make his historical sense. I can acknowledge and I can appreciate the work she's doing, but she has to find a better way of enveloping it in the story without it being like a random chapter that's like 15 pages long just on the backstory of like the history of the town that Elvis is from. Like there has to be a better way. I think this is one of her earlier books and I will say like in comparison Silver Nitrate, which is one of her like most recently published books, it does a better job of enveloping the history. So I do think that she's actually gotten better at it, but like man, was it a journey for her to get to the point that she is now? I'm hoping to wrap this up by the end of the week because I have a delicious, just amazing library book that I like just want to get into. And I can't really like focus all of my attention and time on it because I need to finish this vlog. So I decided I'm not having a good time with this book. I actually switched to the audiobook because I didn't want to use my eyeballs anymore. Now I'm 75% of the way through. If we're being totally real, Half of Maite's chapters is her lamenting the fact that she's not as pretty as Leonora. And then half of Elvis's chapters is him romanticizing Maite, despite the fact that he finds her plain and ugly. That's literally it. The whole like political unrest, missing photos, missing girl plotline, like genuinely seems like an afterthought. Plot things have technically been happening. It's just so who cares, right? We find out that Leonora is part of this like artist collective. And so both Maite and Elvis decide to like get involved with this collective to learn more. They have not crossed paths in this book so far. They have been like kind of like paralleling their stories. The closest they got to crossing paths was Elvis breaking into Maite's apartment and he finds out that she listens to music and that makes her not like other girls. And then that's what leads to his like romanticization monologues because he's like wow she listens to the same music that I do if this was a different course in time maybe I would pursue her even though she is a little ugly not as hot as my ex-girlfriend who was in a cult like that's literally all of his chapters so whatever they're both involved with this artist collective now apparently every guy who's in this collective is infatuated by Leonora. We focus on three specific guys within this collective. The first is Ruben, who is Leonora's ex. Second guy is Emilio, who is the guy that Leonora left Ruben for. The third guy is named Socrates. He has never been romantically involved with Leonora, but he wants to be. And so Maite meets all three of these guys and every single time she speaks to any of them, it triggers her like, I wish I was prettier monologues, which is exhausting to read about. And I guess an actual development about the missing girl who is supposedly what this, this whole plot line is about, but again, who feels like an afterthought is that she does call Maite and she's like, hey, I'm still alive. So that's something, but it's also not because the characters that we follow like straight up don't even care that this girl is missing. We're ending this vlog on a really tragic note. I accidentally stepped on my glasses this morning. Not these, obviously these are fine, but my like everyday like plain black glasses. And now those glasses are like leaning forward like this. So they are unusable. I finished Velvet was the night and I didn't like it. Just like I said I didn't like it, I continued to dislike it. So I ended up giving it two and a half stars. I will say I really liked the ending and if the entire book was more like the last like five chapters, this would have easily been a solid three and a half-ish stars. So still not amazing, 
but like a lot better than a two and a half. This book also suffers from compulsive like heterosexual romance that is not necessary and doesn't make sense to the plot. I originally assumed that it was going to be between Elvis and Maite and then I had a hope that it wasn't going to be between Elvis and Maite at all and that instead the compulsive hetero romance was going to be between Maite and Ruben because at least they talk to each other. But unfortunately for me, for us, for the world, the compulsive hetero romance was between Maite and Elvis and the reason why that annoys me more than all of the other compulsive hetero romances found in Sylvia's books is because Maite and Elvis don't talk to each other at all. And then you expect me as a reader to buy into this epilogue where Maite is on the bus and she's again lamenting how boring her life is and randomly a man sits next to her and says, hey, I've been following you for the last couple of months, not in a creepy way, but as part of my job. And not only have I been following you, I did break into your apartment and I do like your records. So if you're interested, do you want to go to the coffee near your house? And I know this coffee shop is near your house because I've been to your house before. Would you be interested in sharing a coffee with me and getting to know each other? Because I think you're kind of cool and I'm interested in pursuing this relationship. Maite is just like, yeah, okay, let's do it. I don't want to be seen as boring and plain anymore. I want something cool to happen to me. I'm going to have a coffee date with my stalker. Sylvia, look me in the eyeballs. Are you being for real right now? You really think that that's a way to end a book? Ridiculous. So silly. I don't know if I should be annoyed or insulted that she like expected me as a reader to buy into this relationship. Like, does she think that I don't recognize a stalker when I see one? All of the stupid relationships that she pulled by the end of all of her books, this one was by far the dumbest and the worst. Like, come on. So in conclusion, Fart Noise. This book, by far one of the worst books that I've read this month and by her and in this vlog. My final thoughts on Silvia Moreno Garcia is I'm probably not going to read any of her books ever again. I think I'm all Sylvia'd out. I don't think I'll ever see one of her books and feel compelled to pick them up ever again. Like, I've seen enough. I do have a running list of authors to check out to continue the series in the future, but if you have an author that you think that I'm genuinely going to enjoy, please drop their name in the comments. And if you've already suggested an author that you think I'm going to enjoy, just like put it in the comments again so I can actually like prioritize it. Because I understand that everyone loves a good hate read vlog. Everyone loves to be a hater, but this is my second attempt of like this author series and both have been flops and so if i do this a third time and i end up hate reading a book or even worse indifferent reading because at least with hate reading i'm feeling something if i have to do that again three times in a row i might just delete this channel because i don't want to waste time on reading authors books that just end up all being two and a half three three and a half stars i could be reading good books you know what i mean so thank you so much for watching this vlog thanks for sticking it out with me i hope you enjoyed this video i hope you have a great day